Hey guys, welcome and uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, excited to have uh, a, a favorite of mine, but I'm going to let someone else uh, make the introduction <clears throat> because he has a longer history and knows him a little bit more. Uh, I've been on a few trips, but I'm going to let Johnson Ellis uh, uh, introduce our speaker tonight. And, uh, and then uh, Johnson, would you mind opening us up uh, after you uh, introduce Mr. Sparks? Sure. Awesome. Um, Good evening, everybody, and good evening, David. Uh, boy, it, it's just such a treat to introduce uh, such a dear brother in Christ with just such a gentle spirit and, and so very gifted. Uh, David, uh, we've known David and Elizabeth, his wife, for, I guess, about maybe 13 years or so now. And uh, one of our other speakers, Jeff Scruggs, introduced us to David and Elizabeth, and uh one of the many things that David and Elizabeth do is uh, run a ministry called Footstep Ministries. And they lead, I, I would call the very top uh, journeys uh, that you can take with a Christian influence, uh, journeys of, of Paul. Uh, we went to Greece with them and then also did a Romans in the Renaissance uh, tour with them through Italy. And uh, they also lead trips to Israel, to the Holy Land. And uh, uh, you know, one of the, the things that's in David's bio that I love, it says that he has a wonderful way of letting the stones of antiquity speak to our contemporary society. So I've led a bunch of trips around the world myself, and I would never dream of going with somebody else. But, uh, you know, David is and Elizabeth are so gifted. If you ever get a chance, uh, please jump on uh, their website footstep ministries and uh have the blessing of going on a trip with them uh let me uh let me lead us in prayer and then we'll hand it over to david lord jesus we uh we just worship your holy and matchless name father and uh, lord we uh are so humbled at the thought that you've called us into your eternal kingdom father we know that our purpose here on this earth is uh not to grow our personal kingdom, but to, to seek to grow your fame in everything that we do. Father, I thank you for David and Elizabeth for Footstep Ministries, and I just uh, pray that you would speak through David to us tonight. And uh, Father, we pray for our country and those who are in authority over us. In Jesus' name, amen. David, it's all yours. Okay, great. Hey, it's a, a real joy for me to be with all of you tonight, and I can see some of you up on the little uh, call bar there that have traveled with us. Hi, Rick. Hi, Dan. It's great uh, seeing you again, and we haven't traveled with one another in a while now. This is the longest I've been home in over 25 years during this uh, pandemic. It is very, very strange for me, uh, and I can't wait to get back. In fact, we bought tickets the other day to head back to Greece. And even if the tour doesn't happen, we're still going anyway, because we just need to get back to the biblical lands. And my wife is from the biblical town of Berea. And it's an interesting story. Berea is known from Acts 17, 11. The people of Berea studied the word daily, examining it to see what Paul said was in accordance with the word of God. And strangely enough, I grew up in the Dallas area, going to a school named the Berea Memorial Berean Christian Academy, and I went to a church named the Berean Memorial Church, and I ended up marrying a woman from Berea. So it was destined before the foundation of the world that I would be a Berean along the way. And ever since then, I've now started spending all of my life, most of my life, half my life, overseas, either in Greece, Italy, Israel, or Turkey, traveling those lands. I think the one thing that I've appreciated the most about that opportunity is to read the scriptures in context. And that's what I want to talk about tonight a bit and then look at a passage of how the context can help us understand it at a much deeper level than sometimes we do when we're just reading it on the surface level or pulling out a passage. Digging down into the context gives us the opportunity to examine the text and um, ultimately, though, to let the text examine us at a deeper level than perhaps we were aware of when we just 
read the passage. And usually when we hear uh, reading the scriptures in context, there's a quote that says, every text without a context is a pretext to become whatever we want it to say. And I can take almost any passage and twist it around and have it be something totally different than what it once was. But you always want to read the scripture in light of the verses surrounding it, and in light of the chapters surrounding that, and in light of the larger work, whether you're reading the Gospel of Matthew or you're reading Paul's letter to the Romans. How many of you know John 3, 16? I see a few hands up. How many of you know John 3, 15? Okay, I see one or two coming up. But once again, there's a great verse we know. For God so loved the world. If I could hear you all, I would have you all recite it with me. For God so loved the world. But if you step back, one verse, John 3, 15, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. All of a sudden, we have a context now that is 1,500 years before our passage in the life of Jesus. And it draws us back to let us know that God was working for the salvation of humankind 1,500 years before Jesus came in that simple story of Moses lifting up a serpent in the wilderness. Now that gives just a richness to that text you wouldn't get if you just looked at the passage, John 3.16 up front. So not only is there a uh, biblical context, there's a cultural context. What's going on in the ancient Near East? What's going on in the Roman world? You know, the Roman world that didn't believe in sin, it's kind of hard to believe that, but I guess in today's world, you perhaps can understand that more so. But they didn't believe in sin. Look at their gods. Their gods weren't holy gods. Zeus was treacherous. He practiced trickery. He was incestuous. You name every sin you can imagine, and the ancient gods of the Greek and Roman world were practicing them. So Paul had to roll into every Roman city and say, first of all, I've got to tell you about the holiness of God, and then I've got to tell you about what sin is and how we fall short of the glory of God. And then one of the things I really appreciate the most is the geographical context when we're traveling about Israel is about the size of New Jersey. So that's a pretty small state, and yet... It goes from 2,500 feet elevation when you're in Jerusalem. And when you go to Galilee, it's 700 feet below sea level. And if you go to the southern tip of Israel, you go to the Dead Sea, which is 1,400 feet below the sea level. And every time you go there and someone says, how low can I go? You can say, I've been there. And that's the wonder of the Dead Sea. And so... <clears throat> That's kind of a geographical context of understanding in part what Israel is all about as well. And knowing that context really brings home some scripture passages you not, may not be aware of uh, prior to that. Recently, I had COVID. And I spent uh, a good 10 days just in bed. And you can only sleep so long, even when you're, when you're sick. And what I tried to do is I put on the audio Bible and I thought, oh, I'm going to read through the Psalms and I'll find how comforting they are. And then I discovered both Psalms aren't comforting. It's about, oh God, let's slay the enemies and kill them all. And woe is, uh, woe is me kind of thing. But I came to Psalm 23 and there's a reason people love it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me into green pastures. And most of us have images of New Zealand or Scotland. But we don't really expect to see how little grass there is in Israel. And every one I, time I take people to see the valley where David was out grazing his sheep, they go, I don't think sheep can live here. And right about then, a flock comes over one of the hills. And all of a sudden, you get a different sense of what that passage is all about. But we're going to look this evening at Matthew chapter 8. Uh, verses 23 through 27. And before we jump in how wrong it would be to look at the passage without looking at its context as well, that prior to this passage of the storm at sea, we have the Sermon on the Mount. And for chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel, 
We have Jesus teaching us with authority. And with such authority, he even questions the Torah, the teaching of Moses. He says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I tell you, if you're angry with your brother, you violated what God has called us to do. And you have heard, thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you violated the whole important ingredient of what the law was all about. And he speaks with authority because he is speaking as someone who is even higher than Torah. He is speaking authoritatively because he is speaking as the one who is the very presence of God. And so you have this great series of teaching. It ends with, how many went to Sunday school growing up as kids? The great story about the wise man built his house upon the rock and the rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood firm. And in essence, that's what the sermon is all about. Jesus speaking with authority, the authoritative word of God. And then we shift over and not only is Jesus authoritatively a teacher, but he also has authority in his deeds and his actions. And we see in the three miracles that come, there's a series of three right after that our passage is part of. It kicks off that series. And we see Jesus' authority over the natural order. He is going to command the winds and the waves to obey him. And then we'll see Jesus' authority over the supernatural order. What does he do? He casts out a demon, showing us he has authority of the demonic forces that are part of this world. And finally, the concluding one is he says, and I will say to this man, your sins are forgiven. And he shows us that he has authority over the entire fallen order. And he can do what cannot be done by anyone other than him. And that is to bring restoration and to bring the dead back to life because the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is the life that God brings into this fallen order. All right, so, so that's the kind of context. Ours is going to tell us, one, God has authority over the natural order. So what is Matthew all about? Well, Matthew is one of those gospels that is primarily driving home the point that the Old Testament God that we meet throughout the Law and the Prophets finally and fully reveals himself in the person of Jesus. Jesus embodies God. If you want to know what God looks like, don't look at the burning bush. Don't look at the pillar of fire. But look at Jesus, and he will tell us most vividly what God looks like. And that's how Matthew begins his gospel. In the very opening verse, and the very last verse, we find the theme that runs all the way throughout Matthew's gospel. What's the theme? And you shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God's presence with us. And how does Matthew's gospel end? And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Everything from the beginning to the end of Matthew's gospel is driving home this theme of God's presence with us. So every time you read a passage, you say, how does this tell us about God's presence with us? Well, here's our passage for tonight. You've got your Bibles, turn with me, and we'll go to Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. And when Jesus got in the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? O oh, you of little faith, 
Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? I love that passage. And yet every time I read it, there's something that strikes me as very strange. What's strange about it? What was Jesus' trade? He is a carpenter. He sound asleep. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they are all professional fishermen. They're hardcore fishermen. They spent their life in the Sea of Galilee in a fishing boat that's 27 feet long and five feet wide and has four feet of water on it. Incredible thing if you go to Israel today, during a drought in the 18, 1980s, they found a boat buried in the mud on the shores of Galilee during a drought. They excavated the boat and they dated the boat to the very time of Jesus. You can go and see that boat today. It's on display. They actually sailed the boat out. They put that uh, uh, foam all the way around it and sailed it out once again, 2,000 years later. But it's in this boat that Jesus is sound asleep and the disciples who are, quote, not disciples, but they are fishermen, they are scared to death. Does that make sense? I mean, is this their only storm they've seen? It's not a big lake. I mean, it's eight miles long, 13 miles wide. But it's an extremely deep lake. And this gives us one of the clues that running from, as we said earlier, the Sea of Galilee, all the way down through the Jordan River, all the way down to the Dead Sea, all the way to the Red Sea, all the way to Egypt, is a Syro African rift. There's a giant rift that separates Israel from Jordan. And what happens when you have a rift? You see my hand? You get earthquake. And there's an earthquake. If you read this text in the Greek, and fortunately, I have a wife that's fluent in Greek because she's from Greece. And so I call her and say, Elizabeth, read this text for me. There is a word tucked away in there that is extremely significant to make sense of this passage. And it's not the word great storm that we think of as a, a lightning storm that we have outside. In fact, I just heard thunder outside. But it's the word for seismos in the Greek, which means seismic. What kind of storm is this? It's an earthquake. Now that will scare you even if you are a hardcore fisherman. All of a sudden, out of the lake, an earthquake appears. Just 30 years prior to this, there's a Jewish historian named Josephus, and he tells us that there was an earthquake in Israel, not far from the area that we're talking about with the Sea of Galilee, that 30,000 people died during that earthquake. Now that's pretty incredible. You can see how vast the earthquake was because the populations were not as great as they are today in these regions. And yet, here it is, an earthquake taking place. So what do we know about Matthew? He's an Old Testament guy. You shall call him Emmanuel, which comes from Isaiah's passage. Every time you read about an earthquake in the Old Testament, it means God is showing up. God is showing up. Look at every passage that you read in the Old Testament. Uh, there's a great passage. That, oh, come God, make yourself known. I, uh, Psalm 46. Let the earth tremble because the presence of God is coming. When they heard the word earthquake, they instantly know God is arriving on earth the scene of history. Now, are there any other earthquakes in Matthew's Gospel? There are two more. You remember the one? When the centurion is standing there on the cross and Jesus dies on the cross and there is an earthquake and the centurion says, truly this is the Son of God. And there's a third earthquake as well. 
And on the day of resurrection, the angel comes and sits on the stone that has been rolled back, and the earthquake takes place. Now, here comes the good part. What happens at the end of Matthew's gospel takes place in the middle of Matthew's gospel as a little foretaste of what is yet to be. Where's Jesus? He's asleep. By the way, this is just a little aside. Ministry can be exhausting. Make sure those who are ministering the word of God have some time to renew themselves and refresh themselves. Jesus often had to withdraw from the crowds that pressed in on him wherever he went to spend some time for personal refreshment, personal renewal, spending time alone with his father. So I just encourage you, take care of those who minister the word of God. Make sure they get refreshment and time to spend alone with the Lord and are not constantly under the demands of being involved in this. Well, there's Jesus. He's exhausted. And he's asleep. What are the disciples doing? They are panicking. Oh my goodness. Don't you care that we perish? Save us, Lord. What in the world are you doing sleeping when we're perishing here? And what does Jesus do? He gets up, looks around, addresses them quietly. Oh, you have little faith. And he turns to the seas and to the winds, and he says, peace be still, and everything is calm. Now, I think that this passage of Matthew's gospel is a foreshadowing of the very resurrection of Jesus. He is asleep. Low in the grave he lay. And what happens while Jesus is in the grave? His disciples panic. Don't you care about us? How dare you leave us during this time? And they all flee. They all desert him. They all panic. And then Jesus, up from the grave he arose, and he stands up in the boat and he says, guys, it's okay. So Matthew is a wonderful storyteller. And they will hear about this earthquake. And they will remember the earthquakes on the cross. And they will remember the earthquake that took place on the day of resurrection. And they will remember Jesus asleep in the boat. And they will remember Jesus waking up and calming and showing his authority of the entire natural world. So that's, I think, the richness of the context. All of a sudden we see it in its geographical setting of Israel, like we perhaps have not read the passage before. It makes sense of why fishermen would be so frightened. Something quite unusual is taking place, an earthquake on the small lake. Well, every time you want to examine the scripture, you may end up needing to say, no, and now the scriptures need examined. And in our last few minutes here, I want to talk about the application of this text for us. How many of you can identify with the disciples? I kind of raise my hand every time. Because my natural reaction when the storms of life come is to say, oh God, don't you care? Now, I have to tell you, uh, while I had COVID, my wife had COVID as well, and she gets hospitalized for five nights. Her oxygen levels are dropping, and there she is in isolation in the hospital all by herself. No one from the family, no one with a friend can come and visit her. But I have to say, Johnson sent her a wonderful song, and she's now sung it nonstop, and it's, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And in those terrible times of life, we often say, don't you care? Why am I here? 
Or we have another natural response that says, oh God, can you change my circumstances? I love the quote that says, bring down my level of difficulties to the level of my faith. And that's what we often do. We say, bring down the level of difficulties to the level of my faith, because my faith, like those disciples, mine is often like that. It's, oh, you of little faith. But that's kind of our natural reaction, but God's desire for us is to increase our faith. When has your faith been increased the most in your life? My guess is during the storms of life. That's how it often is for me. When the storms of life come, I recognize that they are part of God's providential purpose for my life. I like the clay, and he takes, and he shapes, and he molds me. And sometimes I don't like to be molded the way he's shaping me. But the storms of life often shape us because they bring home that lesson, I can't do this on my own. I live most of my life out of self-reliance and self-resolution. And it's those storms in life that dream home that lesson that without the very presence of God in my life, I'm at a loss. And my wife just loved hearing that verse. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And ultimately, the lesson tells us that God's in control. God's in control. He can handle the storms. They're no surprise to him. He uses those storms as part of his purpose. And at the end of the day, he is not only in control, he not only can handle the storms of life, but the great message of Matthew's gospel is that he promises to be with us to the very end of the age. We can flip that around and say to the other negative part of that, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Or as the Apostle Paul says, nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The disciples experienced that in a boat in the Sea of Galilee during a terrible earthquake. And when they got up, they said, wow. What an amazing God we have. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Even the demonic forces are under his authority. And even he can forgive us and restore us and tell us, take up your mat and walk. And I promise to always walk with you. So that's our lesson for tonight. Well, that was awesome. And so, uh, you know, as you're going through that lesson, David, it, it reminds me of a song that you taught us a long time ago uh, on my first trip that I got to take with my wife with you. And uh, I know Johnson knows it. I know Rick Krell knows it. As this looking across, I'll bet you Mark Good knows it, but I bet you some other guys that know it. Um, uh, Johnson, you know what song we're going to sing, Rick? So, David, would you do us a favor and lead us in that song, The Steadfast Love? Sure, we'd be glad. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. That song has been a blessing, and I'll tell you what, every time that it seems sometimes it's insurmountable, it's a great song just to be just to remember to sing. So thank you for sharing that, Dave. Thanks for sharing tonight. Anybody have any thoughts or any questions for Dave? This is awesome, Dave. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Uh, be with all of you guys. Absolutely. 
Uh, hey, Mr. Krell, would you uh, would you mind closing this up tonight? I would be happy to. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this evening, and thank you for this group of men that come together every uh, Monday night just to uh, hear the word here and uh, to learn more, to, to get closer to you. Lord, thank you for David and his ministry. What an awesome um, disciple that he is of you and uh, his teachings that he brings around the world to the many people that he touches. It's, uh, it's awesome to know him and awesome to, uh, to be a part of his ministry when we have the opportunity. Now be with us tonight, uh, keep us safe, keep our family safe, and um, go with us as uh, uh, in, your, in your blessings. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.